Ten years ago, on the 7th of October 2008, Britain almost went bust. We were on the very brink of Armageddon. The stakes were incredibly high. The giant Royal Bank of Scotland, known as RBS, ran out of cash. They couldn't get to the end of the day. The bank was finished. And the government had just 24 hours to save the British economy. We only had one shot here. If it didn't work, there was nothing else we could have done. This is the story of how a small Scottish bank became the biggest in the world. RBS had assets of in excess of 2.2 trillion pounds. And the relentless ambition of its boss, Fred Goodwin, who drove it to the top. Morning meetings. Fred turned them into morning beatings. Fred was known as Fred the Shred. He was quite ruthless in the way that he got rid of his people. As Fred said himself, my name doesn't rhyme with charming and considerate. <laughs> For eight years, it was a non-stop ride of multi-billion pound acquisitions, fast cars and private jets. The money was flowing in and they were spending it as fast as they could earn it. Then the bank went from boom to bust and threatened to take Britain down with it. With that scale of catastrophe at your doorstep, of course it's scary. The worst could have been no cash in ATMs and hospitals not being able to function. It was really the stuff of nightmares. Could have been one of those moments where you just sort of turn the lights out, get under the duvet, buy a shotgun and some baked beans. Tuesday the 7th of October. There's more bad news on the economy. It's looking very, very bleak at the moment. It seems that the emotions running through the city are fright, fear and panic. At 8am on Tuesday the 7th of October 2008, the Chief Executive of the Royal Bank of Scotland left his suite at the Ritz Hotel and got into a dark blue chauffeur-driven Mercedes. Sir Fred Goodwin had selected the shade himself to exactly match RBS's corporate colours. He was on his way to speak at a meeting of international banking investors. A month earlier, the giant US investment bank Lehman Brothers had dramatically collapsed and there were now real concerns about the stability of the global banking system. It's a big event, upwards of a thousand investors there. My role on that day was to be on stage with the speakers. Uh, I would introduce them, they would give the presentation, and then there was a Q&A session. It was an audience of bank investors. So particularly at a time when confidence was very fragile, being able to stand up and give an assured presentation was really quite important. Fred arrived and we brought him on stage. But I don't remember there being any obvious signs of strain. He had a prepared set of slides which talked about the growth aspirations and the opportunities presented to them. As he was speaking, I had no idea what was going on with the share price, and I think the large majority of the audience had no idea what was going on. It is rare to see markets so volatile. Royal Bank of Scotland is now down 20%, and it's fell on sharply in the past few seconds. It, it just fell as, as we were talking. At the end of the presentation, there was someone with their hand thrust up very enthusiastically, and he was looking at his BlackBerry as he spoke, and he said, uh, Sir Fred, if the opportunities available to you are so exciting and if everything's going so well at the bank, why has the share price fallen 35% since you started speaking? He went white, and Fred was not someone who was often lost for words. He mumbled something. It was clear from the look on his face that uh, he was stressed, and he knew at that point, we all knew at that point, that the bank was in major, major crisis mode. He left the stage straight away. He just stopped, looked at me and said, Manus, I've got to go, and walked out the door, and I never saw him again. The extraordinary story of Fred Goodwin and the fall of RBS 
had begun 22 years before in Edinburgh at the historic headquarters of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal Bank was just an icon. Its executives played a huge and important role in the community. They were all pillars of the society. It was that respectable uh, area of banking that stood the, the Royal Bank in good stead for, uh, well, almost 300 years. Back in the 1980s, the people that ran the bank all had banking qualifications. What came afterwards was very, very different. Following Margaret Thatcher's deregulation of the financial industry, which culminated in 1986 with the Big Bang, Scottish banks increasingly became a target for their larger English counterparts. Having survived one takeover bid, the Royal Bank of Scotland decided to shake up its management team. George Mathewson, an engineer by training with no formal banking qualifications, was brought in as Director of Strategic Planning and Development. It was quite obvious that if we continued the way we were going, that the bank would have to be taken over. Yeah, this is the boardroom, and this is my erstwhile boss. I went to the chairman and said, I would like to be given a brief to change the bank. Mathewson quietly began to recruit a new young executive team around him. I had never worked in a bank. I hadn't worked in finance. My background was maths and economics. George phoned me and he suggested I come and work in the Royal. I wasn't a banker. I was minding my own business in San Francisco. The phone rang. Uh, George Mathewson was on the phone and saying he was moving to the Royal Bank and would I like to join him? George decided that it was necessary to look at a major reconstruction of the entire Royal Bank group. Costs had to be got down. The stock market was dumping the shares. There was a real crisis. Something had to be done. Mathewson got rid of many of the old RBS executives and tasked his new team with an ambitious plan to modernise the bank called Project Columbus. We re-engineered all the payment systems, we re-engineered the credit systems, we re-engineered the sales process. We were the first bank to introduce telephone banking, for example. You could phone up on Christmas Day and make a payment if you were so inclined. We were one of the first banks to talk about putting branches in supermarkets. It was a groundbreaking project, and it worked. Mathewson's Project Columbus transformed the Royal Bank of Scotland, and by 1997, he'd tripled profits to over £800 million a year. The changes allowed OBS to survive, because had the changes made in the early 1990s not been made, OBS would have been gobbled up and become part of one of the other big national banks. But we moved to a view in which the bank really saw you as a source of cash. How much can we get from this person? Can we sell them a mortgage? Can we sell them life insurance? Can we sell them unit trust? It did make me wonder whether we had begun to create some sort of monster over which we had very little control. On the morning of the 7th of October 2008, as the RBS share price collapsed, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, was attending a meeting in Luxembourg. It was a meeting of the European finance ministers, they meet monthly. He didn't want to go. He knew that he should be in the Treasury to handle the impending crisis. However, if he hadn't turned up, he was frightened that it would spook the markets even more. It's after he starts the meeting that events really get going in London in terms of the RBS share price collapsing. It's down about 30% at one point. It's been suspended twice. Christine Lagarde, the French finance minister, was asking, what's going on? I said that you know, at some stage I was going to leave because I was going to have to go and sort this out. While Darling was in the meeting, his team received a call from London. The chairman of RBS wanted to talk to Alistair directly, which is always a bad sign uh, when a bank chairman, you know, urgently wants to speak to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Sir Tom McKillop had been chairman of RBS for less than two years. He'd come from the pharmaceutical industry, and this was his first experience of a banking crisis. He was clearly very, very anxious and very agitated. And he said, look, we're hemorrhaging money. There's billions going out of the door. 
what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, how long can you last? And there was a pause, and I thought I heard him talk to somebody, and he said, well, we're going to run out of money this afternoon. Alistair said he did feel scared at that point. Of course it's scary. With that scale of catastrophe at your doorstep, the largest bank in the world about to collapse, it took me, you know, a nanosecond to think, we can't allow this to happen. And so I went back to London to make sure that it didn't. Back in 1998, George Matthewson had become chief executive of RBS and re-established it as Scotland's biggest and most successful bank. But at 58 years old, he was looking to appoint a successor. OK, we're running. Try not to look at the camera. You would... OK. Thanks. He had his eye on Fred Goodwin, the 39-year-old chief executive of the smaller Clydesdale Bank. Fred was decisive. Very intelligent, quite confident for a young man. He was much younger than the other chief executives. Goodwin had originally trained as an accountant and was marked out by his systematic approach to cost cutting. Fred was known as Fred the Shred, and he got that nickname during his period with the Clydesdale Bank. He was quite ruthless in the way that he got rid of his people. There was nothing nice about it. As Fred said himself, my name doesn't rhyme with charming and considerate. <laughs> so you have to look at these things with a, a degree of scepticism. Goodwin's reorganisation of the Clydesdale persuaded George Mathewson to offer him the posts of both finance director and deputy chief executive at the Royal Bank of Scotland. The day of his appointment, I did get a call from the Clydesdale Bank they told me they'd been partying for three days and good luck. They'd just had enough of the man and his rather rough and abrasive management style. With Fred Goodwin on board, he and Matthewson were soon confronted with a problem. In early 1999, their chief rival, the plain old Bank of Scotland, made an audacious bid for the much larger English bank, Nat West. RBS really had a sense that if they didn't participate in that deal, then their rival, Bank of Scotland, would become much larger than them, and they would then be the small fry and they would be swallowed up by someone else. So it was quite a sort of, it was, it was a pivotal moment for RBS. Matthewson and his new deputy decided that RBS, despite being less than half the size of Nat West, would launch their own hostile takeover bid. There's a huge amount of traditional city scepticism and snobbery about, as they see it, a couple of relatively small Scottish banks scrapping over buying this much bigger English bank. I don't claim because I run a corner shop that I can also run Tesco's. And it's that situation. I admire them, uh, I like them, but I don't think they have the knowledge to run this business. That really spurred on George Matthewson and Fred Goodwin. They were determined to prove their critics wrong. Here you are, about to take on the slumbering giant, twice your size. size. You know, some people mm. call Nat West a great dinosaur. And surely, at least in a kind of five-year term, it can do nothing but slow you down. Why we're so successful is we know the risks to take and we know how to manage the risks. And Nat West is an acceptable risk and it is a tremendous opportunity. Fred Goodwin wrote the takeover document. And I think he did a remarkable job in that. I've always said that was his magnum opus. In our offer document, we've set out 111 initiatives of things we would do to address cost issues. More importantly, we've set out 40 or did specific initiatives which we'd implement straight away to address income-related issues. Fred was pivotal to the takeover of NatWest, and he was really quite brilliant. He knew the detail, he knew the numbers, he was very much inspirational. The best we can do is to explain our case and explain the facts to investors and let them make their mind up. Bids for NatWest close on Monday night. Then the city's big shareholders will decide. Amongst the key decision makers on the NatWest takeover were the city's giant asset management companies. It was the day which would decide the deal. And Fred put his head round the door and said, Mercury Asset Management, ma'am, have come out for us. 
And I said, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Edinburgh is confident tonight that it'll soon be home to a major new force in banking. The takeover of Nat West was a, you know, a great moment of, of our Scottish banking. You know, after uh, 100 years and more of English banks owning substantial shares or trying to take over Scottish banks, here was a, a role reversal. The takeover of Nat West in January 2000 was seen as a great coup by the city. And soon after, George Matthewson was appointed RBS chairman. At the age of only 42, Fred Goodwin became chief executive. In less than six years, he'd risen from unknown accountant to running the third biggest bank in Britain. The main headlines here at 11 o'clock. RBS shares plunge, nosediving through the course of this morning. By mid-morning on the 7th of October 2008, with the Chancellor Alistair Darling returning from Luxembourg, responsibility for handling the crisis fell to Mervyn King, Governor of the Bank of England. On the morning of the 7th of October, I was able to return a call to Tom McKillop, the Chairman of Royal Bank of Scotland, who basically said they could not get to the end of the day. Over the previous few months, Mervyn King had been made aware of the worsening situation at RBS. Fred Goodwin would, would phone the bank and, and me personally to update us on the problems they were having. They had been able to borrow money for three months, and then it was one week, and then quite quickly, they were struggling to finance their balance sheet by borrowing overnight. Now, just imagine yourself trying to run a business where the only way you can stay afloat is to borrow vast amounts of money, you know, tens if not hundreds of billions of pounds, every night. Repay it the next day and try and borrow it back all over again. Now, markets were simply not willing to lend to him even for a matter of hours. They couldn't get to the end of the day. The bank was finished. When you've got a bank in a mess. The bit that you can always do immediately and that you have to do immediately is the Bank of England simply lending a troubled bank money, what's called emergency liquidity assistance, to give one the space in which to sort out the permanent answer. The Bank of England had made liquidity loans before, but RBS's huge size meant that it would need an unprecedented level of emergency funding we basically decided that we would have to extend whatever cash RBS needed to get through that day, but to get through the next few weeks. We had no choice. The banking system as a whole was going to collapse. Mervyn King asked Andrew Bailey, a senior official at the Bank of England, to meet John Cummings, the chief financial officer of RBS, to discuss how much the bank needed to stay afloat. I know John quite well. He was he was quite stressed, obviously, and um, you know this was an unprecedented situation. So we talked about broad numbers. Uh, I think John talked about a number up to about twenty five billion pounds at that time, and that that could be needed very quickly. The Bank of England suspected that RBS would need much more liquidity than they were asking for, but lending vast sums of public money to the struggling bank created a new risk. If we had simply said, well, today we are lending Royal Bank of Scotland 30 or 40 billion pounds, I was worried that we would simply trigger a run on the bank. So I was determined that we would have to do this covertly. The Bank of England secretly transferred government bonds to RBS, which you could then swap in the markets for cash. It worked very successfully, and the operations did solve their immediate liquidity problems. Total lending facility to RBS reached its highest level at just over £36 billion. It was a very big intervention. I think it's one of the biggest interventions ever done anywhere. But the billions lent to RBS by the Bank of England was only the first step. It was going to cost the British taxpayer far more money than that to keep the bank alive. Eight years before, in 2000, following the successful takeover of NatWest, 
RBS's new CEO, Fred Goodwin, embarked on a series of major acquisitions of businesses and banks in Europe and the US. These are the staff magazines for the Royal Bank of Scotland. So this is the uh, March 2002 edition, looking here at uh, outstanding results for 2001. And you've got Fred Goodwin there, George Matthewson, got that nice optimistic feel with the sky above. There was a real belief at RBS that they were very good at acquisitions. They could buy things, they could improve them, they could make them more efficient, they could run them better, and then they would be on to the next one. 2003, and this is when a winner car scheme came in for long-serving staff. So a member of staff could win a car each month. So you've got that month's lucky winner uh, being presented the car by Fred. We felt part of something really big and something that we wanted to be proud of. Great people and a great bank, and it was a, a great place to be. But not everyone enjoyed working at RBS. Morning meetings, Fred turned them into morning beatings, where a lot of people were taken to task in front of their peer group and given a damn good thrashing. On some occasions, they really could get quite personal and quite nasty. Look, I was aware that his style was abrasive. People have said it was abusive. And I was certainly unaware of that. I treat all such statements with a pinch of salt. I had a half hour meeting with him shortly after we took over Nat West. He wanted me to save uh, an extra five million. Uh, he made his points forcibly. And if it had been a boxing match, it would have been stopped after 10 minutes. You just didn't know how to operate. He, he gave you very few degrees of freedom. I may have suffered slight post-traumatic stress syndrome. I, I wasn't in a war or anything, although it felt like a war sometimes. He created a, a fear and blame culture, which I don't think helped RBS in the slightest. I haven't met anybody in RBS that actually liked him. I would classify Fred as a, as a friend. That doesn't mean I regard him as flawless, by the, by, by the way, nor he me, I'm sure. While some found Goodwin a challenging boss, George Matthewson wasn't the only one who thought highly of his CEO. Many in the city were equally impressed. I was quite pleasantly surprised when I first met him because he actually had a quite a sort of dry sense of humour. He had incredible detail about the bank sort of at his fingertips in his mind. He was clearly uh, in charge. In 2002, Fred Goodman was named International Businessman of the Year by Forbes magazine, a huge accolade in the highly competitive world of banking. The growth of RBS was something which people took a lot of pride in, where it was seen as a symbol of economic prowess. RBS was popular with politicians too. By 2004, the bank was paying more than £800 million a year in tax, revenue which helped to fund New Labour's huge programme of government spending. Treasury enjoyed the tax revenues that the banking system and people like Fred Goodwin provided. The regulation, as a result, was light touch. I'll see you later. The entire climate of the time was go easy. These are engines of growth for the British economy and times were good and it seemed like it would carry on like that forever. And under this government, Britain will not return to the boom and bust of the past. In June 2004, on the recommendation of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Fred Goodman was knighted for services to banking. His charitable work as chairman of the Prince's Trust was also recognised. Sir Fred Goodwin is another person I want to thank because uh, we couldn't do this without, uh, again, such a hard-working chairman. His uh, contribution is quite remarkable. Thank you so much, Fred, for all your wonderful help. Under Fred Goodwin's leadership, RBS had become a major player in world banking, with operations in 27 different countries, 
Its growth in the US was particularly strong, having bought several banks that were profiting from the lucrative subprime mortgage market. The growth of RBS was really blinding almost everyone across the political spectrum and across the financial establishment to what was really going on underneath the surface, under the bonnet. And what was happening was that RBS had effectively grown far too fast. It was simply too big for any individual, no matter how talented, to understand and manage effectively. It's been another tumultuous morning on the market. Some of Britain's biggest banks have seen their share prices plummet again. At one point, the value of shares in the Royal Bank of Scotland was down by more than 30%. So we're just seeing again, I think, a knee-jerk reaction this morning of, of panic. Robert Peston, then the BBC business editor, had been tracking the crisis in British banking for over a year. But even he was shocked by the speed of events on the 7th of October, 2008. Make no mistake, there is an emergency out there. We can't have too many more days like today. I just couldn't believe that I was actually, you know, reporting this stuff. It just felt so unreal. Share prices of our biggest banks tumbling, all sorts of anxiety in money markets. A solution has to be found. The stakes were incredibly high. It could have been the mother of all economic depressions. We could, you know, it could have been one of those moments where you just turn the lights out, get under the duvet, buy a shotgun and some baked beans. By lunchtime, a bailout team reporting directly to Gordon Brown were already hard at work at the Treasury. The Prime Minister was determined that we were going to have a preemptive, comprehensive plan. The Treasury was in the front line in terms of implementation. The Treasury team was made up of leading bankers, government ministers, and top civil servants. They had no illusions about the critical nature of the task they faced. The likelihood of, of RBS failing would have been complete panic uh, amongst every human being in the United Kingdom and every other client of RBS. Uh, the worst could have been no cash in ATMs and hospitals not being able to function. It was really the stuff of nightmares. We were on the very brink of Armageddon. The Treasury had been closely monitoring ailing banks like HBOS for some weeks and preparing an emergency bailout plan for the whole banking system. But the sudden collapse of RBS had caught them by surprise. Well, the, the bailout plan wasn't ready. It required quite a lot of calibration. Being in the Treasury at that time felt like being with lots of people who were trying to gather information in a really fast-moving environment. Judgments that would have normally taken days had to be made in half an hour. Now, how much money is the bank really short? Uh, how much do they have to raise between now and 4 o'clock? So, so just this, this stream of, of intelligence gathering. The markets were incredibly fragile. The plan needed to be preemptive ahead of the market. That's a very narrow space. We had to land in that space. I was feeling you know, physically sick. Uh, it was terrifying to be involved in something so enormous. I mean, it, it's a disaster movie type stuff. Where is the superhero? <laughs> you know? Gordon Brown asked Alistair Darling to finalise the bailout plan before markets opened the following morning. The Chancellor of the Exchequer now had less than 18 hours to deliver. It would have been about two or, th two or three o'clock in the afternoon by the time we got back in from uh, the airport. All the team that dealt with you know, this crisis, they were all there. Alistair was very calm and said, you know, he would deal with it. He wasn't um, panicking. Alistair doesn't panic. The Treasury is pretty calm, and actually the design of the building is such that it would be extremely difficult to foster any panic, even if you tried your best to do it. It's the, the classic corridors of power. The Chancellor's office is just off one of those. Alistair wasn't 100% confident the plan would work. However, it was the best plan they had. We knew what we had to do, and, you know, in my experience, you, know, you shouldn't really panic unless it's absolutely necessary. The Treasury's bailout plan was to address the crisis in the markets with a massive injection of cash and government assurances. 
The numbers involved were huge. Um, there was loan guarantees of over 250 billion pounds, for example, and the asset protection scheme was of similar size. If RBS failed, the government feared it would create a domino effect, bringing down other major British banks and crippling the economy overnight. To prevent that, the Treasury promised to underwrite losses of up to £500 billion to secure the banking system. The scale of it was really quite important that people saw large numbers. What it really identified was the British government was going to do whatever it took to actually protect the financial system of this country. What we were trying to do was to say to the UK, to say to the world, the British banking system has been shored up it is safe, it's robust, it will be functioning as normal from the next day. The most radical part of the bailout plan was a proposal to use billions of pounds of taxpayers' money to buy shares in any bank at risk of collapse, effectively taking them into public ownership. What we needed to do was first and foremost make sure that banks had adequate capital, that's money behind them that they could draw on, uh, so they could carry on functioning, but also critically give markets and investors confidence that they had something to fall back on. The sheer scale and speed of the government bailout plan was unprecedented. This is not an off-the-shelf scheme. This is something that was radical. It could absolutely have erupted if people had responded badly. We only had one shot here. If the plan worked, it would be fine. If it didn't work, there was nothing else we could have done. And you do not get two shots at these things. There was only one job to do. Get the thing done for Wednesday the 8th morning before markets open. Honestly, nothing else was relevant. At his headquarters in the city of London, Fred Goodwin was waiting to hear the details of the bailout plan. Its key proposal, that the government become the majority shareholder of RBS, would spell the end of his career at the bank. It was not a solution that he was likely to agree to. Only three years before, RBS was flying high. By 2005, thanks to Goodwin's constant drive for international acquisitions, it had become the fifth largest bank in the world, and more than a quarter of its profits were now coming from its US operations. The money was flowing in, and they were spending it as fast as they could earn it. RBS has moved into the world of lavish uh, corporate entertaining, into the world of corporate jets. If we got a story, that Fred Goodwin had a private jet. We had chapter and verse on it. We had the name of the jet, we had its flight patterns. I got one of my colleagues just to put in a courtesy call to the press office and say, you know, do you want to make a comment about this private jet? And they went away and they came back and said, there's no private jet. The private jet even had a personalised number plate, GRBSG. Eventually, I then rang up and sort of got quite angry with them, and they still came back with some, some utter nonsense about how this was a jet that the bank owned as a leasing thing. And it was just nonsense. This refusal to admit that they had this jet was sort of redolent of an organisation that created its own reality. But the feeling was very strongly that success and too much money had gone to Goodwin's head and to the head of those around him. In July 2005, Sir Fred Goodwin moved RBS from its historic St Andrews Square base in central Edinburgh to a new site at Gogerburn, on the outskirts of the city, at a cost of £350 million. So this is a £50 note which had an illustration of Gogerburn, sort of corporate gift item that was issued to VIP visitors and guests as part of the opening of Gogerburn. It was a very grand occasion. It was a royal opening, of course. You had the Queen, you had all of the political class coming to what was effectively the opening of a, of a bank building. Even a prudent bank needs to build a new headquarters once in a while. 
you had a fly pass by the RAF. I mean, this is something that's usually done for great royal occasions, not for the opening of a business office. That was a bigger fly pass than the opening of the Scottish Parliament. But look, there was absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, to establish a, a major international headquarters of what was becoming a major international bank was an unmistakably good thing. It's quite extraordinary that a wee country like ours could produce something that really is, I think, leading the world now. I remember this amazing, uh, you know, mock street with lots of shops and in reality were offices. I mean, the building is just a building, but what we hear today is about the future. It's about the future of the Royal Bank of Scotland. We face that future with a sense of optimism. The future is always unknown, but we face it with a sense that the opportunities will be more than the challenges. It was just overkill. Welcome to Gogar Bar. Goodwin had personally overseen every aspect of the design of the new building. The executive wing was massive, and Fred Goodwin's room was like a tennis court with fantastic views over the hills that surround Edinburgh. He had an eye for detail right down to the, the, the colour of the carpets. The attention to detail there really tipped over into excess. I've always regarded that degree of obsession as kind of a Fred foible rather than anything else. He is a man for detail. I think he should have focused on the big picture instead of the colour of carpets. Some of Goodwin's more exotic design features in the private executive wing attracted the attention of the press. When the Sunday Times reported that there was a scallop kitchen in there, Goodwin uh, objected. The scallop kitchen, as he pointed out, wasn't just for scallops, it was for all forms of uh, seafood, which made him sound even more remote. He didn't take kindly to any form of bad publicity. I think if, if he'd been a more likeable person, the press might not have had it in for him. When the Sunday Times went on to claim that Goodwin was planning to build a private road from his new HQ to Edinburgh Airport, he began legal proceedings. Hubris has really set in. RBS has achieved a lot, of course, but it has a chief executive who will not accept criticism. Britain's big banks under sustained attack on the markets. As we go on air, there are crisis talks about how to stabilize the banking system. By early evening on the 7th of October 2008, just over 12 hours before markets opened, the government team now needed the banks to sign up to the bailout plan. Having briefed the Prime Minister at Downing Street, Alistair Darling returned to the Treasury to meet Sir Fred Goodwin and Britain's other top bankers. All the biggest banks in the country were there. Fred Goodwin came about seven o'clock. Very impressive, it was calm, collected. He could very well have been your proverbial duck that looked calm on the surface and was paddling like mad underneath, but it wasn't obvious. However cool Fred Goodwin appeared, he and his bank were clearly at the center of the crisis. If RBS had failed, the consequences for the other banks in that room would have been very severe. So they were all in this together. They were not used to be in the position from being the masters of the universe to very much uh, coming as supplicants. Some of them were ashen-faced. They were all scared. But at that stage, they didn't really know, you know, what the government had up its sleeve. At the centre of the bailout plan was the request that, to calm the markets, all the banks signed up publicly to a £50 billion package of capitalisation. In reality, while HBOS was also in trouble, RBS would be by far the largest recipient and the government would become its major shareholder. There was no agreement from the banks to sign up to the collective deal. 
they wanted to negotiate on that issue of the shareholdings. One of them said, what if we don't agree to it? And I said, well, uh, tomorrow morning when everything crashes, you can explain to your shareholders that you didn't fancy doing what we're, what we're asking you to do. So that was the end of that conversation. And so Alistair Darling said, try and understand the deal better. It was like, you don't understand. Once you understand, you'll sign. I was just trying to sort it out because the clock was ticking all the time. If we did not have a done deal by 7 o'clock the following morning, that was it. So the banks all trooped out and I was sent down to explain it to them. And in that meeting, it was clear the pressure was moving around the room and at some stage, somebody said, come on, Fred, we all know it's your issue. His fear was that if we'd announced eight banks, 50 billion, and the minute we announced it, seven banks said, it's not us. Well, it's him. With the bailout negotiations set to run into the night, Treasury officials decided to send out for food. There's actually a very good curry house just on the south of the river, which I'd been going to for years, and uh, somebody hit the idea, why don't we get them to bring some curry in? There was this enormous order placed, which was actually piled high in, in little containers uh, next to the Chancellor's office. It was available, really, to anyone that evening to come in and take. Well, it's a sore point, the Balti, because I didn't get any of it. By the time I'd made my way back from this meeting with the CEOs, the Balti had been completely hoovered up. As midnight approached, Goodwin and the other CEOs were still refusing to sign up to the bailout plan. I worked out if I stayed in the building, there was always a chance that I might relent. So I told them right at about 11 o'clock that I was going to my bed. It was a very bold move and a very good move, because if he hadn't left the building, the banks would have chiselled away and tried to make adjustments as they saw fit. By 2 a.m., all except one of Britain's major banks had agreed, in principle, to the conditions of the bailout. Fred Goodwin was resisting until the end the need for RBS to have any capital. We didn't say, we are forcing you. We said, the banks need capital, and this is the money that is available. He didn't have a choice. Only 18 months before the bailout in February 2007, Fred Goodwin's RBS looked invulnerable. The Royal Bank of Scotland has announced the biggest profits ever made by a Scottish company. RBS made more than £9 billion. RBS's record profits owed a lot to the performance of their US banks, in particular the investment bank Greenwich Capital. Greenwich Capital had substantial operations in mortgage markets. They had a reputation for being quite aggressive in terms of, of the risks that they were taking. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Subprime lending, writing home mortgages to people who just a few years ago might not have qualified for one. It was clear that there were potential problems building up in the US housing market and in the subprime segment of US housing in particular. HSBC issued a profit warning at the beginning of 2007, which was one of the signs that, you know, this was really going wrong with, with, with US subprime. I don't think anybody had the sense at that point, or very few people had the sense at that point, that there was a major crisis in the offing. Uh, but it felt like a correction could be, could be coming. Despite the ripples of concern about subprime, Fred Goodwin and his new chairman, Sir Tom McKillop, were confident about the outlook for their bank. And here at, at RBS, business is very good indeed. I can't predict the future. Uh, it's something we have in common. None of us can predict the future. We do uh, operate within an economic environment that, that is positive and looks set to remain positive. In April 2007, Goodwin's RBS joined forces with two other European banks, Santander and Fortis, and launched a hostile bid to buy the huge Dutch bank, ABN AMRO. John Varley, the chief executive of Barclays Bank, was already in talks with ABN over a possible merger. The decision to buy ABN AMRO 
is very much driven by Fred Goodwin's determination to beat John Varley, who he'd come to see as a great rival. I'm always a bit skeptical of these kind of explanations to say it was all down to one person's ego, but in this case, I think that did bear a big, big part in it. To put off RBS, ABN AMRO's CEO, Reichman Hunig, sold its prestigious US investment bank, LaSalle, which Goodwin had identified as one of his key targets. You can't get LaSalle anymore. Um, what, from your perspective, from RBS, really makes um, a possible deal with Sabian Amro interesting to you? We would like to have uh, owned LaSalle, but our shareholders are very clear that the residual attractions are significant not just financially, and indeed, you know, financial attractions are the least of it, albeit they are very financially attractive. You could sort of feel the RBS team convincing themselves that it still made sense for them to do this deal. What's most curious about it, though, is that as the deal progresses, when it becomes more apparent that there's something serious happening in the financial markets, there aren't efforts made by the regulators or some of the main shareholders to pull the emergency brake. Thousands of anxious savers pressing at the doors of many northern rock branches, waiting to get their money out. In September 2007, a growing credit crunch in the financial markets caused the first run on a British bank in 150 years, as northern rock dramatically collapsed. Even that didn't deter Fred Goodwin. A month later, on the 17th of October, his RBS-led consortium won the battle for ABN AMRO, paying a record 71 billion euros for the Dutch bank, most of it in cash. When I heard it was a cash offer, I really thought the poor guy had taken leave of his senses. Buying ABN was just catastrophically hubristic, arrogant, wrong. In order to, for the acquisition to work, they were operating at the absolute minimum amount of capital that they were allowed to by regulators. Clearly, that was a very risky position. If this goes wrong, you really have nothing left in the tank. With very low capital reserves, RBS were now dependent on being able to borrow billions of pounds from other banks on a short-term basis becoming too dependent on short-term finance was suicidal for this bank. At precisely the wrong moment in the cycle, ahead of a financial disaster across the West, RBS becomes, with the purchase of ABN AMRO, the biggest bank in the world by balance sheet, with assets of in excess of 2.2 trillion pounds. This year alone, more than a million Americans are expected to lose their homes to foreclosure. Closures hit a record last quarter, rising even among borrowers with good credit. Seeing uh, continued subprime ripples uh, working their way around the world. As the crisis in the US mortgage market gathered speed in late 2007, financial analysts began to suspect that RBS's giant new balance sheet contained significant amounts of toxic subprime mortgage packages, known as CDOs. One of RBS's key US banks, Greenwich Capital, which specialised in CDOs, was now starting to lose tens of millions of dollars a month. By April, with RBS's reserves depleted, Goodwin, now desperate for cash, was forced to turn to the bank's shareholders. Because the Royal Bank has just got out the biggest begging bowl in the history of British business. Goodwin's plan was to raise 12 billion pounds by selling cut price shares in the bank through a rights issue. So RBS basically sold new shares to its investors, which was hugely embarrassing given that, it, you know, it was less than 12 months since they'd made this massive acquisition. Encouraged by their chief executive, many RBS employees invested heavily in the rights issue. The, the feeling at that time was that Royal Bank shares wouldn't go below two pounds, so it was a, it was a good deal to take up. So um, I took up my full allocation Former RBS chairman Sir George Matthewson, who'd retired from the bank in 2006, also took up the offer. As far as the rights issue is concerned, I, I thought the bank still 
stable and solid and supported it. How much money did you invest in there? Let's just say a lot. Nobody was thinking I could lose all my money here in six months. The idea that a big bank like RBS would suffer losses of such a scale that it would have no capital left was, was something, even at that point, that people weren't really contemplating. In September 2008, the giant US investment bank Lehman Brothers collapsed, sending shockwaves through the financial system. Stock markets have fallen here and around the world as one of America's oldest and biggest banks files for bankruptcy. The point about Lehman Brothers is you just knew if a bank like that is allowed to fail, any bank could fail. By the beginning of October, Fears that another major financial institution could collapse paralyzed lending between the banks, and the final lines of credit that RBS needed to survive were cut off. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, Britain's biggest banks finally agreed to sign up to the Treasury's bailout plan. I got up at five o'clock. When you're in 11 Downing Street, the flat is just above the, the work, if you like, so it doesn't long, take long to come down. Uh, but what I had arranged the night before was I wanted a meeting at five, because I wanted to know where the negotiations had got to. About 5.30, he was taking this briefing. I was told by our lead official that our proposal to put 50 billion pounds, it's a lot of money, uh, into the system to provide capital for the banks uh, would shock the markets because they'd think it's got its worse than we thought uh, and it would be better to do 25. So we eventually agreed, you know, after about 10 minutes, we'll announce 25 billion pounds and I will say there's 25 more to come. And everybody's happy because apparently they weren't going to add 25 and 25, but it still came to 50. He read the announcement, made a few tweaks. We got confirmations from the banks before seven to say they'd sign up. As we were about to acquire substantial shareholding in RBS, I had to sign off, literally sign off. And I remember sitting overlooking St. James's Park in central London, just as it was getting light. And it's such a historic moment here. You know, you are acquiring a large chunk of the world banking system. Having signed off the deal, at 7 a.m., Darling left the Treasury to present the bailout to the media. At 9.20, he arrived at Downing Street to make a joint statement with the Prime Minister. Good, strong banks are essential for every family and for every business in the country. And extraordinary times call for the bold and far-reaching solutions that the Treasury has announced today. I just say this, that we are going through a period of extraordinary turbulence in every part of the world. Every single country is being affected. When I look back now, there's not many occasions when you can honestly say what we did made a difference. Uh, and this is one of the occasions it did make a difference. If we had not done what we did, then the banking system would have collapsed and the consequences would have been calamitous. It was never really about saving the banks. It was about saving the economy from the banks. As a condition of the government bailout of RBS, Sir Fred Goodwin was forced to resign as chief executive, but not before he attended an extraordinary meeting of the bank's shareholders, who'd seen the value of their shares fall by over 90%. I would like to hear Sir Fred Goodwin actually say sorry. Well, Mr Black, I wouldn't want there to be any doubt in anyone's mind at all, other than I'm extremely sorry that this has come about. I echo entirely uh, the sentiments that the chairman expressed on behalf of all of the board earlier on. This is a, uh, something about which I am extremely sorry. Despite his apology, Goodwin insisted on keeping his considerable RBS pension pot. £700,000 per annum, index-linked, as, as long as he lived, to me was obscene. I mean, it was absolutely obscene for having destroyed a business. I can understand the outrage, but in order to get people into a job like that at that time, that was the, that was the deal. 
Wouldn't it be fair to other pensioners in Britain that your pension is linked to the share value of the bank that you ran? No, my pension is the same as everyone else in the bank who's in a defined benefit pension scheme. It's the same as it's determined in the same way as anyone else and any, anywhere else who's in a defined benefit pension scheme. Under pressure from the government, Goodwin agreed to give up almost a third of his pension. But he remained the focus of public anger over the bailout, and in 2012, he was stripped of his knighthood. He still lives in Edinburgh and declined an invitation to take part in this programme. Fred Goodwin got a lot of the blame, but a lot of other people deserve a share of the blame too. The RBS board didn't do its job properly. The regulators paid insufficient attention. The government was high on tax receipts from these booming banks and didn't ask the right questions about what was really going on. I don't defend what he did in terms of expanding Royal Bank of Scotland. But if you're not careful, you start to think, if only that terrible man, Fred Goodwin, hadn't been there, then we wouldn't have a problem. And that's wrong. It was a system as a whole that failed, not one individual. Following an official inquiry into the fall of RBS, the head of its investment division was banned from taking another top city job. But otherwise, no further action was taken against Goodwin, his management team, or the RBS board. Over the last decade, the bank has been caught up in a series of financial scandals and disputes with customers, and recently paid a record fine to the US authorities for its role in the subprime crisis. But under the leadership of CEO Ross McEwen, in 2018, the Royal Bank of Scotland announced a profit for the first time since 2008. Any financial service business must always hold two things dear. Firstly, it's financial strength, and the second is its reputation. We lost both of these. We fell the furthest. We've also, we have changed the most. We are a different bank now. The government has now begun to sell its shares in the bank, slowly returning it to private ownership. It's unlikely, however, that we will recoup all of the £45 billion invested in RBS. In all, the government bailout of the banking system cost the British taxpayer well over a trillion pounds. The economy has yet to fully recover, and Britain has endured one of the most turbulent political decades in living memory. I think that we're still dealing with the aftermath, really, of, of that whole crisis. A system where banks took risks and they went wrong, and nobody was really punished for what happened is still the source of a lot of anger amongst ordinary people who don't quite understand how that was possible. The gain over decades was privatised to the bankers and then the pain was nationalised to the country. I think so much of what's happened since then, the erosion of confidence in business leaders, in politicians, stems from that crisis and bailout, because it crystallised in people's minds that this place was not being run for most of us, it was being run for a privileged few. And people are still angry that many of those privileged few kept the money and most of us are continuing to pay the price. <laughs>